Hello and welcome to the Black Runner Podcast number 115. Uh, my name is John and with me as always is Ryan. What's up, Ryan? Good morning. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know what, it's the lull before the storm as far as Star Wars goes right now. It's kind of uh, quiet times. And so um, we're going to take the opportunity this week to um, do an episode that we've been, or mainly I've been meaning to do for a while now. Uh, to pull the curtain back just a little, Ryan and I have an Apple Notes uh, document with a bunch of um, show potential show topics on there, and uh, one of them that that I put on the on the list that I've been wanting to do for a while is to talk about the first issue of Star Wars Insider Magazine, um, and that was issue number twenty three, which came out in uh, I think nineteen ninety four. Um, and so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to, we both have a copy of the magazine and we're just going to kind of talk about some of our, our favorite parts, um, of this magazine and just kind of take a look back at Star Wars, uh, fandom and, and, and the state of Star Wars in, in 1994. So kind of fits along with our power of the nineties, um, kind of series that we were doing for a long time and have not um kind of return to so much lately uh we still have our our episode we need to do ryan on 1998 mm-hmm. to, to do our last sort of like yearly episode as far as the the power of the 90s go um and then this year we've we've done a few things that are related to 1999 and i think we'll do some more as the year goes on so um i guess this is power of the 90s right um, I mean, it's Star Wars in the 90s, so it's powerful. <laughs> yeah, we can call this Power of the 90s uh, for sure. So, And I, we, we briefly touched on, on this issue, I think, in our, uh, our episode devoted totally to 1994. But um, yeah, we're going to jump in and, and talk about it. Uh, Ryan, you are a current subscriber to Star Wars Insider, are you not? Uh, yeah, I am-ish. Uh, so... Fun fact, Star Wars Insider is, like, the one subscription in the world, uh, at least in my world, that does not (laughs) auto-renew. Um, (laughs) yeah, so my subscription, um, that I had for the past, uh, year, uh, expired, and I didn't realize that it had until, like, a couple days ago, like, I saw them posting, like, the new issue on Twitter, and it's like, subscribers already have their copy, and I was like, wait, I don't, and, uh, yeah, it turns out my subscription had expired and did not automatically renew, so uh, I guess I'm not a subscriber right now, but I'll probably sign up again, I haven't quite decided. I'm not used to having this choice because uh, <laughs> everything just like takes money out of my bank account every month, like everything else in the world. So, yeah, yeah. right on, right on. Well, I have, I'm, you know, well, I'm not ashamed. I was about to say, I'm ashamed to say this. I'm not ashamed that I haven't, you know, um, ever, you know, committed to spending a lot of money on a magazine, but uh, I, I've never been a subscriber to Insider, which is weird. Uh, not shameful, mm-hmm. but weird. Um, Mm -hmm. just cause I really like it. And, um, you know, especially in the nineties, I really, really loved it because it was one of the only sources for news, uh, as far Mm -hmm. as Star Wars goes and not just, not even just news, but like celebrating Star Wars. Um, and so, yeah, I used to always pick it up at, uh, at Barnes and Noble or other places, but, um, didn't subscribe and, and still haven't, um, ever subscribed, which is weird. So, uh, maybe I'll feel inspired to do that after talking about issue number 23 today. We'll see. Um, (laughs) But, uh, yeah, so let's just, let's just jump in and, and start looking at, uh, this, this first issue of, uh, of Star Wars Insider. Now, uh, it's the first issue of Insider, but it's issue number 23, which, uh, is a little weird. Um, but, uh, that's because, um, the first 22 issues were called the Lucasfilm Fan Club Magazine, and, uh, it transitioned, uh, kind of over to being Star Wars Insider in, uh, with issue number 23. Um, so, I mean, Lucasfilm fan club, uh, you know, you had Indiana Jones and, uh, maybe Willow, Willow here and there, some Willow content and, yeah. uh, Tucker, a man in his dream. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think one of the things here is that in the mid 80s to very early 90s, Lucasfilm was maybe more of a company that had made some Star Wars movies and then had turned its attention towards doing other things too, in addition to Star Wars. And I think by the time 94, certainly 95, but 94, um, even 93 really rolls around. I think Lucasfilm is becoming again, a company that is like primarily focused on Star Wars um, with a little bit of attention spent on other things. And so um, I would imagine that the magazine changing over to Star Wars Insider from Lucasfilm Fan Club magazine is um, reflective of that, of, of the fact that like, hey, we're, <laughs> we're really going to be focused on Star Wars going forward um, with the prequel trilogy uh, and the special editions before those mm-hmm. on the horizon. So uh, I think it only made sense. And of course, like Star Wars Insider in the 90s and still, right? I mean, we'll... we'll um, will feature Indiana Jones content and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not like they, they changed the name and, and then, you know, sort of, or like anything related to, you know, Indiana Jones or Willow or whatever is like henceforth, you know, banished from this magazine. It wasn't like mm-hmm. that. It was just, um, it's going to be 90% Star Wars anyway. So we might as well call it that. Yeah. Yeah. And I Makes think for sense. me being, being a kid who was 11 or 12 years old at the time, being at Barnes and Noble, uh, I don't think the Lucasfilm fan club magazine would have had the same appeal to me or, or like mm-hmm. I would have noticed it, uh, on, on the racks quite so much. So, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 It was a good, it was a good branding choice. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, now I did go back and look at, um, issue 22 of the Lucasfilm fan club magazine. And that issue is about 30 pages. And, uh, this issue here insider 23 is about 50 so I think the magazine did kind of grow a little bit with um, with the name change as well, um, which is cool. Uh, yep. Yeah, I've never um, actually read a Lucasfilm fan club magazine. Like uh, looking at that issue twenty two, um, like how much of it was Star Wars? Um. Yeah, so I, I I read it about a week and a half ago, um, and I had to pull it up again to say for sure. But um, basically, the format was pretty much the same um, from mm-hmm. issue twenty two and issue twenty three, um, and uh, it it may have been like a little bit more focused on Indiana Jones and that kind of thing. Um, but like the the sections in the magazine and, and stuff were all pretty much the same. So. It was like fan letters and then you'd have news from different departments. So it'd be like, what's the news from Lucas Arts and what's going on in mm-hmm. publishing and that sort of thing. And there's just m- way more Star Wars like video games than anything else. And there's definitely way more Star Wars books and stuff than anything else, you know? So it's mm. like, it would feel very Star Wars, I think. Or yeah. it did feel very Star Wars too. So, um, and then, you know, one of my favorite things in the magazine, which we'll talk about um, at length today, I think, is the... Uh, the Jawa Trader, the giant mm. catalog of stuff to buy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was definitely, um, it was, I don't think it was called the Jawa Trader in the Lucasfilm Fan Club magazine, but um, it was still there. And uh, yeah, I mean, there was, there was plenty of stuff to buy from Lucasfilm in general, but again, it was like mainly Star Wars. So mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but, but like I said, I, I do think that, you know, the magazine changed uh, somewhat from 22 to 23, like it grew um, and definitely like the the focus was on Star Wars because that was, you know, right there in the title and everything. But um, but yeah, it was would continue to have, you know, non Star Wars stuff in it if Lucasfilm was involved and and it did before, too. So um, I think Star Wars was always the or usually the biggest focus. So. Yeah, yeah. Also worth noting, uh, three dollars and fifty cent cover price. Yeah, yeah. Which sounds like a steal now, um, mm-hmm. but that probably equates to like a six dollar magazine or something at least. Um, back in in you know, like what would feel like six dollars now? You know, I think. Yeah. I don't yeah. know, because I was still buying comics for what a dollar at this time. Yeah. Buck twenty five, maybe a dollar ninety five if it was like a, a special embossed holographic cover with a trading card and a poster. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean I well, I don't know. I guess most magazines probably were about three fifty. It's probably like a standard price for yeah. a magazine around that time. 
But but now Insider is a little more of a premium magazine price. Oh yeah. You yeah. Know? I mean any magazine is a premium magazine <laughs> at this point like yeah. Well, I mean like a like a Time or a Rolling Stone or a Newsweek or something. I think those are still like 5 bucks or under, aren't they? I doubt it for Rolling Stone for yeah. sure. Okay. Um yeah. I mean like when I picked up that the Vanity Fair, that was like seven or eight dollars i think yeah no that's that's probably right that's about right i think they are selling them obviously in uh lower volume now than they were so yeah uh, and things are just more expensive so it makes sense yeah. but cool all right well let's kick it off by looking at this uh this beautiful cover of uh of mm-hmm. insider number mm-hmm. number 23 um this is uh this is pretty funny to me <laughs> So was of, was Photoshop invented at this point? It was, but it was in its infancy, I believe. Um, <laughs> okay, because cool. yeah, you can tell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty funny. It's got this image of uh, of, of Ben Kenobi, um, kind of over in the bottom right corner, um, and then just like some X wings flying across the front of the magazine. And then, uh, what is that supposed to be? I think it's just Earth <laughs> um, in the top <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> left corner. I don't know if it's supposed to be Yavin or something, but um, yeah, it's just like. But but what's funny about it? I mean, not only is it like you know by today's Photoshop standards, and I'm not saying I could do a better Photoshop than this, you know, mm. too much, but but <laughs> at least a little better, I think, at this point. But that's just because the the tool has progressed, not because you know I'm so talented or anything, but like. The, the X-Wing models or whatever they are are like so brightly lit and then <laughs> Obi-Wan is like so dully lit like the the brightness on those images it's just like little things like that like you got to balance mm-hmm. that stuff out or otherwise it's very apparent that they're <laughs> from different sources you know um, but anyway it's just uh, it's just very 90s which um, mm-hmm. I'm sure at the time it was it was cutting edge but um, yeah it's uh it's very 90s so and it does feature that original star wars insider logo of course which is uh is pretty pretty beastly too pretty cool um Mm -hmm. and and then a preview of things to come you got a nice photo of princess leia and uh c-3po singing holiday special tunes up in the top right corner because that will be uh, something that's looked at in the magazine so Mm -hmm. yeah um but uh at the time, the, the publisher and editor of the magazine was Dan Madsen, and uh, the senior editor was John Bradley Snyder, and those are both names that, um, you know, we continue to hear uh, about, and uh, it was really fun actually going up to, or kind of leading up to uh, the 20th anniversary of the first Star Wars celebration to hear from Dan Madsen on a couple of podcasts, um, Blast Points, and um, the, uh, the Force cast. Uh, talking about that first celebration and his involvement with that because it was Star Wars Insider that put that on. Um, and that's why it happened in Denver, Colorado. And this magazine was published out of Aurora, Colorado, which is how far from you, Ryan? Uh, like three minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, the next town over, huh? Yeah, basically. <laughs> All right, nice, nice. Yeah, so um, that's kind of cool for you. You know, you're a Denver guy now. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, an insider, uh, at the time was a Denver magazine. So, um, you got, you, you, you are, you were living now in what was then the epicenter of, uh, Star Wars insider and Star Wars. Mm. So, yeah, you got to try to track down the, uh, the, whatever warehouse they used to use to, uh, <laughs> maybe there's any, like any leftover Jawa trader merch anywhere, you know, that kind of thing. Ooh. Yeah, that'll you don't, get me arrested. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so you don't seem like you're gonna cool. do that. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I can find the post office box <laughs> where it used to be sent to. Dude, that I might be a start. A, actually. I could take a picture that could of be a that, start. post it on our Insta. There you go. That could be yeah. a start. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, um, so as far as the content in the magazine goes, the 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 first page uh, of of the real magazine here um, is an introduction from Dan Madsen um, talking about you know Lucasfilm fan club going through this change to become 
um, the Star Wars Insider, and you know, it kind of talks about the history of of Lucasfilm fan club and the magazine and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but then on the right side, um, the the news is is confirmed that the special editions are on their way. So um, that had been. Uh, recently announced and is is featured here, so that's like the time frame we're living in with this issue of Star Wars Insider is is uh, you know just finding out that um, the Star Wars special editions are are on the way. So um, exciting stuff, no doubt at the time. Um, after that is uh, a couple pages of Rebel Rumblings, which are the the letters uh, from mm-hmm. fans at the time. So. You know that's kind of fun at this point to go back and look at uh, at what you know fans were thinking and, and kind of where people's minds were. Um, I think it's super appropriate that the first uh, letter here um, is from Lawson uh, from Clinton, Illinois. Um, I don't know if uh, if you're familiar with Clinton, Illinois. <laughs> I don't think I am. Not too much. Mm, mm. Where is it? Uh, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> um, it's where it's where Lawson uh, Rudisil lived in uh, 1994, apparently. Mm. Um, shout out to Lawson. Uh, but the first uh, title of the first letter in here is, um, well, actually, it's for the whole whole section. It's Star Wars Lives. And I think that is entirely the vibe of this issue is yeah. like guess what star wars is happening again you know that stuff that you loved we're gonna celebrate that stuff that you love but we're also going to get pumped for these special editions and uh the you know the prequel trilogy which is in this issue they're saying is the f- episode one is set to release in 1998 um but at the same time like also, like, check out all these books, these video games. Like, Star Wars is here. Like, it it lives. And I think that's just, like, super appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, and, man, this, this magazine is really, um, I don't know, how to, cute? Um, or just, like, <laughs> well, like, I'm looking on page four, and at the top there's this image of um, Han Solo on Hoth with his, like, radio communicator thing. He's, like, tuning a dial or something and (laughs) the text says the insider is always listening for your signal send us a letter today (laughs) and uh i don't know it's just it's just very it's like a a, it feels like a more innocent era in uh in star wars uh (laughs) fandom i guess you know where where you know the people making this magazine were like i don't know let's just grab a screenshot you know from from empire and and uh write a a cute little line to go with it so that was fun um the the last section of Rebel Rumblings, the the heading is uh, excited about red tails. So um, there was. Uh, there oh my was, goodness! Yeah, yeah. So even in the letter section, um, it wasn't all Star Wars all the time. There was there was other stuff that the, the magazine would would uh, focus on as well. So. So yeah. I didn't realize that Red Tails was announced at like people knew about it in 94 because that movie didn't come out until what like 2007 2008 yeah somewhere around there i know it was post um prequel trilogy so yeah yeah i don't remember the story on red tails entirely um but i know it was a project that george was wanting to get done for you know a long time um, mm-hmm. so that was something that he, he was working on. Um, and I don't think he ever planned to direct it himself either. So yeah, it was probably one of those things where the script was, um, done or at least a draft was done. And, you know, it was something he was hoping to maybe get produced, uh, before the prequels. Um, mm-hmm. and then once the, once that didn't happen or, you know, whatever, uh, maybe it got put on the back burner until he was done with the prequels. Cause I can't imagine George <laughs> in, you know, in 1996 or 1997 through 2005, being able to have any time to work on anything besides uh, besides the prequels. I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, when they finished um, post on The Phantom Menace in, in 99, it was, uh, you know, pretty much get that movie released and, and get through the release and then go right to work on Attack of the Clones. So, 
Yeah. And, and you know, yeah. that's how the cycle went, like, three years for each movie, but it was just a rolling, you know, thing where it never kind of stopped, so. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it was something he was wanting to do, for sure. So, um, got a cool Earth 2 uh, ad uh, for some TV show I don't remember that was on NBC in the fall of 1994. Um, and then the Star News section, uh, which is just kind of... Um, quick rundown of what's going on in the news and uh, at the time and then an advertisement for a product that um, I need to maybe try to track down. I would imagine it's not worth anything anymore. Although <laughs> these things were all the rage with QVC and magazine advertisements in the 90s and uh, this is the the Hamilton Collection uh, Star Wars Trilogy plate with a 4 millimeter 23 karat gold border um, and uh, it was limited to a total of 28 firing days. Um, so I guess it only went in the kiln for 28 days and then like as many as they could make in 28 days was all they were going to do or something. Is that what that means? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I, I, it would be kind of fun to have a plate. I don't know. <laughs> we've, we've talked about this before that, um, you know, if, uh, you know, if uh, if Hasbro doesn't get their act together and start getting like these these figures out uh, at a regular rate and at good prices, that we're just gonna start collecting plates and coins instead for Star Wars. I kind of like it. I kind of like it. That's, um, that's the I, I might want to do it anyways, though. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> Even if Hasbro okay, does get their act together, I may want to just fair. do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also a, a section here after that um, about all the Lucasfilm news that's kind of not related to Star Wars. So uh, George Lucas receiving his honorary doctorate from the University mm-hmm. of Southern California. I like it. Um, mm-hmm. Updates on the Radioland Murders production, uh, post-production and release, which uh, was supposed to come out in October of that year, I suppose. Um, and uh, you do see um, a a uh, a prequel alumni, and you wouldn't have been an alumni at the time, but uh, uh, Gavin Boquette, who worked on the prequels, listed there, so that's kind of cool. Um, and then just a bunch of info about like THX and ILM and Skywalker Sound and mm. all that stuff. So uh, if you're a real Lucasfilm stan at the time and you want to know about every department and what they're doing, not just Star Wars, then they had you covered. Um, but again, like especially now looking back, and well, no, I was going to say, especially now, looking back at these, the ads are kind of my favorite thing. But even at the time, I remember the very first time I saw a Star Wars Insider at Barnes & Noble, it was the Jawa Trader and, like, the ads for stuff that, like, made me most excited more than anything. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it's still that way looking back at this because I just flipped Ryan to the page with the official pewter Star Wars chess set uh, advertisement, mm. which is insane. It's so crazy. Cause I it did the it looks really cool. It does look okay. really cool. And pewter was a big deal at the time. No doubt about it. Because I'm seeing the word yeah. pewter popping up in this magazine all over the place. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was a chess set that you did not buy as a set. You bought the pieces individually for 1995. Um, and if you did that, then the Danbury Mint, who produced this chess set, would... Uh, actually, I, I, I think you do buy the set all at once but they don't list the price of it <laughs> as one um, price they list the pieces individually as 1995 because that's what it costs for each pewter chess uh, piece here uh, 1995 so you add that all together and it's 640 dollars for this chess set which is crazy uh, what do you think these go for on ebay right now ryan well so funny you should ask because i just uh did a general search on ebay uh for star wars pewter (laughs) and they're probably the six thousandth person to do that general search today alone on ebay but yeah Mm -hmm. who doesn't want star Uh, wars pewter go ahead i mean there's a lot of pewter (laughs) out there that's star wars um yeah like doing a search for star wars pewter gives you 1,121 results. And that's everything from Monopoly pieces to um, like special pins to just like straight up uh, just pewter little pewter things. <laughs> um, but uh, 
if you want a complete set uh, with the um, with the board as well, which I mean, you have to have that because it's super cool looking. Um, they sell anywhere from five hundred and forty nine dollars to over a thousand. Wow. Yeah, I'm seeing these now. Um, and uh, you're right. There's one for 1100 listed here. But you say they sell for that. And I'm curious as if as if uh, whether or not they do sell for that or if they list for that, because mm. um, is it really anybody who's like right now trying to spend six hundred dollars on on Star Wars chess? I don't know. Maybe there are people. But OK, so I now I'm looking at the sold ones. Yeah. And they have sold from anywhere between 200 to 500. Wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, I mean, and looking at the photos of it, it is like super cool. It, it definitely looks really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I would pay, yeah, not that much, but it's cool. It is definitely cool. <laughs> One um, half portion. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, the next thing in the magazine is an ad for the radio dramatization, um, a script of the radio dramatization, yeah. actually. Which I had no idea this existed. I mean, it makes so much sense that it does, but yeah, uh, yeah I don't think I knew either. And just last week, we were talking about Dooku Jedi that I Lost. Lost. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and how, as much as we want to listen to it, it'd probably be easier to just read the script and totally yep. the same thing here for the the radio drama it would be um yeah probably just more convenient to to get the script and read it because you could do that a lot faster than i think like each radio drama is over 10 hours at least right so mm-hmm. um, yeah it's it's a lengthy prospect to listen to them so um but that i remember i mean in the 90s the the radio drama and all that stuff was definitely pretty like a pretty big deal um, just cause yeah. it was like, well, there was stuff in there that's not in the movies and there's stuff that's changed and, you know, um, it had, uh, it had an aura about it. It had, um, it had, uh, yeah, definitely like it, it, it was thought of as a big deal at the time. Yeah. And like, I remember this was probably the first time I was exposed to national public radio, like that title um npr yeah um and i remember like there being something like weirdly exotic about that as well (laughs) i don't know uh what it was but it's like i don't know like there's a national public radio that's like free for everyone but they also do like star wars stuff yeah well, it was awakening your latent socialist tendencies at the time you just didn't know about, you know what I mean? Which yeah, I'm surprised it didn't activate mine, but because um, <laughs> I <laughs> can't really relate to being excited about the NPR part of it. But I mean, and then it like that would just lead me straight down a road Don't of do it. <laughs> um, <Don't> do it. <laughs> Antifa and car talk. <laughs> <laughs> car talk, yeah. <laughs> right on, right on. Uh, what's the one about economics or whatever about the, like the market market watch. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't know what it's called. I hate no. that. Is marketplace. It marketplace. Marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. And then wait, wait, don't tell me. <laughs> uh, what's the Ira Glass one? Uh, this American life. Yeah. Yeah. This American life. I mean, cl- classics npr yeah i don't listen to too much npr anymore um honestly because now there are podcasts but um when i did listen to npr more i would always get so mad when like market place or whatever it's called would come on yeah because i'm like ah you know like i don't know anything about money i don't want to listen to this yeah um and that continues to be true um okay as we um continue through the magazine on page 14 i just have to point this out there is a super goofy um, oddly vertically stretched image of C-3PO and R2-D2 uh, on the left-hand side, and it's just it's so <laughs> 90s Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 90s Photoshop. Just, just get it in there. Yeah. Um, and then um, there is an interview with uh, the vice president of, uh, of 
licensing Howard Rothman, um, starting on page 15, or actually it starts on page 14, but, uh, but page 15, um, there's an int- interesting quote there um, that points out that like as far as like licensing goes and publishing and stuff, they can't cover anything set for a couple of generations before the original trilogy because that's what the next trilogy would be about, but they can do stuff that's after the original trilogy. Um, and uh, I, I just thought, like I read that quote from, from Howard Rothman and I thought, wow, so where was George's mind at this point as far as episodes seven, eight, and nine and even 10, 11, 12, if he was considering those at that point. But was he, like, why was that, why was it cool to do prequel era stuff in the 90s? Uh, or not cool to do prequel era stuff in the 90s because he was going to make those movies. But the idea that, you know, you can do stuff after is fine. You know, is it just because he thought, well, 7, 8, 9 will happen, but it'll be so far down the line that we can, you know, forget about those books at that point? Or is it that by this kind of point in his life, he was thinking, okay, I just need to do the prequel trilogy and then put it to bed. Yeah, yeah. Um, And at this point, um, Heir to the Empire and the Thrawn trilogy had already come out or were still coming out. I don't know about Last Command if that was out yet at this point. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, I mean, it's not like the decision was, was being made sort of right at this time that you know this mm-hmm. this sequel era stuff would be okay but not prequel era but um just that he's kind of putting it in those terms you know like well licensing we can't touch stuff that's you know right before the original trilogy because george is doing that but we could do stuff after you know yeah and now if you go on to the next page this is this is really cool the publications timeline mm-hmm. um where it's like, you know, you have the um, original trilogy there, and then you have, like, um, everything, all of, like, the books and stuff and where those fit in. Um, and, like, the after Return of the Jedi section is its own page. Yeah. Like, because there is so much. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah, well, like the glove of darth vader (laughs) yes yes prominently (laughs) featured yeah um actually gets more space like from top to bottom than than like anything else almost uh well let's see the first three mission from mount yeah that's all glove of darth vader series isn't it yeah yeah yeah. that's all our 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 guy um our cyclops friend yeah uh cygor no, he's not called Sigor. No. What was his name? We talked about him so much when we did our first mm-hmm. Power in the Nineties episode, and he's the best. Triaculate? Yeah. No. Is <laughs> it, isn't it something? Tri Triclops? No. Oh, no. I don't know. He's the best though. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and it's just funny because like this timeline, you know, they talk about it and sort of say like, well, we're gonna keep updating it, but like three or four years from now, it would be so packed uh, if that it was you wouldn't t- even be able to fit it. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> Um, yeah, so True Set Bakira and the Crystal Star I see on here. I've read both of those. Um, I think I read Courtship of Princess Leia as well. So I was doing okay in 94 as far, well, I probably hadn't read them in 94, Mm. but I kept up all right in that early part, but you know, it would soon, um, become impossible. Yeah. The Hand of Thrawn. What is that? I don't know. That's like, it's a post, uh, Thrawn trilogy book. Um, what is that? I've yeah. never heard of that. The Hand of Thrones. Okay, we can keep going. Uh, a pair of novels written in uh, written by Timothy Zahn uh, is what it says. Huh. Okay. Uh, oh, Spectre it's a of duology. the Past and Vision of the Future. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. All right. Um, so in 1994, there were as many Thrawn books coming out as there are now. <laughs> Have you grabbed the newest Thrawn book? No. No, me neither. I'm still trying to finish the first one. <laughs> uh, but did you read the second Thrawn book? Yeah. <laughs> All right, <laughs> this cool. is a conversation for a whole nother time. <laughs> All right. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> 
All right, let's talk about the Forces Back contest at the bottom of page 18 from the Tops Trading Company. Uh, um, yeah, I want to see if uh, if you think you can if you can do this, if you think you'd have a chance at winning um, the grand prize, which mm. um, what you could win for the grand prize would be a Star Wars Galaxy Millennium Falcon Publisher's Proof Set plus one autograph set of new Vision cards from the Premiere Series. So that's pretty yeah. sweet. So um, number one... Lando, number two, Greedo, number three, Anakin. Okay, this wasn't fun because you just said the answers before we said the questions. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah, they're really easy questions. These are no... Um, oh, who who wrote the, the crazy trivia Rusty, book? Uh, Rusty... Rust- I forget his last name. Rusty something, but yeah. Yeah, this, this was not... These questions were not up to Rusty's standards. Yeah, but 31 people were going to win prizes for this and uh-huh. they were cool like uncut sheets of star wars galaxy trading cards come on I boxes would love those yeah i would love those yeah right but you turn your nose down at this contest okay i did not turn my nose down i just said the questions were way too easy all right let's get into what really matters here in star wars insider which is the jawa trader and uh first off i love like the title page for the jawa trader is so good it's just like a picture of the <laughs> desert <laughs> with this logo <laughs> so good yeah yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. There's like there's a vibe to this cover. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of what it is. Like I'm thinking like hot sauce. Hot sauce. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually I can see it. I, I can see it. <laughs> I think it's the color temperature of the image of the desert because it's just like so orange and yellow and it and seems the the font. The font is pretty 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 hot sauce. I could see it. Yeah. And you know what? The uh, catalog is pretty hot sauce as well. So let's let's jump into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First page, bunch of Indiana Jones. So they, they definitely weren't um, shying away from uh, that stuff like we talked about before. Yeah. Uh, man, I love it. You could get like the one sheet posters for... Um, the Japanese poster. Mm-hmm. Get the Japanese poster. You can get the, the one sheet for The Last Crusade, 27 by 40 for $3. Three dollars was the price on that. Um, super good. Um, and then there were, um, yeah, like other posters too. What is L one twenty eight? It's a book, I guess, huh? Indiana Jones and the Unicorn's Legacy. Man, might need to track that down. But yeah, there's some sweet mm. uh, Indiana Jones merch. But then we jump right into Star Wars and um, stuff. Um, gets real quick, so good. I, I'm still not done with the Indiana Jones. Okay, part. sure. Um, Okay, first of all, that Japanese poster for six dollars. Yeah, yep. Oh mm-hmm. my god. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, it's for Last Crusade. Um, but man. Um, and then there was an Indiana Jones role playing game. Yeah. From West End. I did not know that. No, I, I wasn't aware either. Now that would be thirty dollars. So that's uh. Yeah. That costs actual money, but still. Um, yeah, that would be cool. I, I didn't know that either. Yeah. Okay, we can move on. Okay. Um, so, yeah, then we get into new Star Wars products right on the front here. Um, the uh, the re-releases of the Art of A New Hope, Empire, and Jedi books are there. Um, we talked about um, the Art of A New Hope in our 94 episode, Power of the 90s. I have that one over on the shelf, thanks to Kevin, but those are great. Um, and then the, uh, the Tomart's Price Guide to star wars collectibles um which we will talk about later because there's uh an interview with steve sansweet or a column written by steve sansweet and he talks a lot about that mm-hmm. but um man i want I, I really want to track that down as much as i love looking at the jawa trader here i think i would like really love looking at the tomart's guide to collectibles yes um, and i don't have it so um other things i don't have are this star wars audio box set in a <laughs> like millennium falcon shaped container um which seems really cool um and uh, it's a whole bunch of cassette tapes yes a bunch of cassette tapes <laughs> yes um and uh w- w- what you get on those cassette tapes is uh the heir to the empire series so the three book cycle uh, of the heir to the empire is what you get on there um mm-hmm. and uh you also get the story hammer tong from Timothy Zahn, which is uh, the a story that was featured in Tales from the Mos Eisley Cantina, which would mm. not come out until August of 1995, according to the magazine here, but it's on that uh, cassette, so you would have had that ahead of time. Pretty cool. 
Wow. So, yeah. So much huh. audio tapes and, and stuff in this magazine is crazy. Like the Java Trader is like 70% like, well, not 70, but like 30% <laughs> audio tapes. There's so much. It's like so much. Yeah. Um, so that's God, cool. And I just, I love these, uh, these covers um, of, for the audio tapes. Like I love like the gray border and um, everything. I'm looking on the next page right now at like the, um, the separate uh, Thrawn trilogy and Courtship of Princess Leia and, jedi search and all these like they just that's such like a that's such an aesthetic mm. yeah to feature like a a, a shrunk down co- cover and then just have that like 80s computer gray uh kind of yeah like, yeah <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool pretty cool um yeah and then obviously tons of books in here hardcover copies of the books um the art of Star Wars Galaxy trading cards. Um, mm-hmm. That was on, or no, are those the comics? No, the trading cards. Yeah. Yeah. The art of Star Wars Galaxy uh, trading cards um, reduced to nine ninety five there, so that's a steal. Um, one of my favorite books ever: A Guide to the Star Wars Universe by Bill Slavichek, um, on sale for ten dollars there. So. Um, yeah, and, and all the novels and stuff that were out at the time. Also, the Super Nintendo hint books for uh, Super Star Wars and Super Empire. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, that's pretty cool um, because they are official. They're licensed, and at during this time period, uh, it was not uncommon for uh, unlicensed hint books to make it out into the market so those would be the ones that have the the covers with like zero actual art from from the game um maybe some like weird off-brand drawings uh there but like that would continue through you know basically like the end of the 90s the unlicensed hint book uh (laughs) phenomenon (laughs) But these are definitely licensed, and they have uh, really great covers. Yeah, yeah. I especially like the Empire one with like the the purple background. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that looks awesome. Yeah, you can also get uh, you can get really great Star Wars mouse pads from the Java yes. Trader also. Uh, but I'm gonna flip over to page 24 and 25 in the Java Trader and. Uh, there's a wealth of Star Wars posters on sale here, just like the Indiana Jones ones. Um, some really great Star Wars posters on sale. Uh, one that I think is really cool, and I've seen um, versions of this at at uh, Star Wars Celebration um, in the you know in the the vendor area, uh, and and for a pretty hefty price is the Star Wars radio drama poster. Mm-hmm. Um, although I've seen like full size ones, these are smaller, but it's like C3PO at a mic stand, um, speaking into a pop filter. Super cool. Uh, that was 12 bucks. Um, yeah, uh, lots of good stuff here. Um, there's the, uh, the Star Wars spaceship poster, which I feel like they still sell that today. I'm not sure. Uh, it's, (laughs) it's, uh, LP 18 there is the code for it. You see that poster? (laughs) Like I've seen that poster so many times. (laughs) <laughs> um but it's great and uh yeah no lots of great posters uh here um as well as 3d postcards and other um uh, limited edition you know kind of like star wars art stuff um and then on page 25 is some really great stuff if you're into trading cards um mm-hmm. tins and collectible um releases and calendars with tops art in it and uh, all that kind of stuff and then uh, of course, there is the Star Wars Millennium Falcon Factory Set Galaxy Trading Cards um, product there. So, um, yeah, it's got all 140 Series 1 cards, all six uh, Series 1 Chase cards, exclusive card number zero, a 3D hologram card, a Series 2 preview card, and includes one artist autographed card inserted in this limited edition set of 10000 only 95 bucks. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so what really caught my eye here was the uh, Star Wars Galaxy uh, trading card box um, that uh, it was c- consists of 36 eight card packs. Um, you know, it's 
the sealed box here is selling for $35. Um, but it's one of the rare products in here that actually you can get uh, cheaper now. Because I just looked on eBay and you can get a box of um, unopened box of Star Wars Galaxy cards for 30 bucks. Nice. Nice. Yeah, uh, trading cards, I think these days, uh, unless they're super rare, are not quite as desirable to people, it seems like, as they used to be, mm-hmm. um, which has me feeling like that's uh, that's an area I should jump into and just get like a nice collection of trading cards. Um, we've talked about that before, mm-hmm. uh, especially when we were looking at um, some of the tops books that came out a few years ago from um, uh, looking at the different series of Star Wars trading cards and stuff. Uh, they're really cool. They're they're fantastic. And uh, yeah, they're not that expensive these days. So pretty sweet. Um, what other merch should we talk about here from the Jawa Trader? Um, some hologram watches, which are cool. Uh, there's definitely, um, you, gotta, you have some options as far as plates go from the Hamilton collection. Mm. Um, those are only $37.50 a piece. So, I mean, that's a good deal. Uh, the Halloween masks look fantastic, especially the Emperor Halloween mask, which I love. Um, this is on that look, page one. That looks really good. It does. It, it's awesome. Like, and I feel like that's uh, like an iconic one, sort of. You know, like as soon as I saw that, I was like, "Oh yeah, that mask." Like I know that mask. Um, yeah. So I like that. Um, yeah. Um, cool. Let's see what else. Oh, there's a ton of models. Um, which uh, look really good, the Snap models. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, this is even like, so they have the the ships, but then they also have the figures, like the vinyl model figures too. Um, sort of like a Bandai type thing, you know, but in 1994. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if these are painted or unpainted. I think unpainted. Um, but, Probably. Uh, yeah. Um ready to assemble and paint yeah so those are unpainted but uh but yeah. pretty cool um just an update um i do have some potentially good news if you are looking at getting into star wars uh hamilton plate collection collecting uh you i'm looking on ebay and you can get a lot of the plates for between 10 and 20 dollars Nice. Yeah, I'm into that. I kind of want so, some plates. So, yeah, get some of those. Go to, uh, like, Michael's or wherever and get those um, special plate racks where you can hang plates on your walls. Like, they have, like, a little groove in them that the plate will sit in. Is that the idea? Yeah, well, yeah. And, like, I'm thinking there's, like, ones that are just, like, metal that are just, like, wire metal that um, you can put plates in as well. Um yeah, that could that could be that could be a look. Wow! Like get them over a doorway or something. Yeah, get like five plates across there. Well, I'm sitting in a room right now with a lot of Star Wars crap, Ryan. Uh, lots of different kinds of Star Wars, you know, items. Star Wars crap. Mm-hmm. Uh, How many plates do you have? I don't have any plates. I don't have any plates, and so then what's the point room is kind of an embarrassment uh yeah totally yeah right so maybe uh plates are gonna happen i like it yeah yeah um pages 30 and 31 may be the best pages in the magazine as they are it's a two uh, a full two-page spread uh about the star wars pewter collection so it's all pewter all the time Mm -hmm. on pages 30 and 31 (laughs) yeah yeah so um, yeah emphasis on the pewter (laughs) Yeah, and I mean these things are cheap. They're like twenty seven fifty for a three inch tall Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is like this is for a different for? level <laughs> of Star Wars collector. This is for a someone who collects Star Wars and also has class. Yeah, yeah, someone who wants their Star Wars to be made out of the rare, not rare metal pewter. What is pewter? What is it? Is it a metal? It's just pewter. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't need to be justified any further. It is uh, pewter and it is awesome. Um, A two page spread from 32 to 33, all about the role playing game. So that's pretty sweet and kind of shows off just how much um, was going on in the 90s with the Star Wars, you know, role playing games, late 80s, early 90s Mm -hmm. from West End Games. So lots of cool stuff in there as well. Um, 
And I bet this is one of those things where some of these are worth more now than they were at the time and some of them are worth less, but yeah um most of the the original west end game stuff like has maintained like some semblance of value Mm -hmm. um but usually you can still get them like below cover price um but you know some of them uh some of them go for a bit more cool Page 34 in the top um, left corner is a, uh, a photo of all the Star Wars cardboard stand-up, um, you know, life-size stand-ups that were out at the time. And it's like, if you've ever been in a comic book shop in the 90s, you've seen uh-huh. this is like activating the memory thing for you. Yeah. Like these, are, these were very popular and, um, and all over the place. Yeah. And they're, they're cool. They're, they're definitely cool. All uh, New Hope era images of uh, the big three and the, the droids and a stormtrooper. I don't see a Vader there. I bet there was a Vader, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. And then um, on page 35, there oh, is an entire- This is the best. This yeah, is the best. An entire section devoted to George Lucas super live adventure merchandise, uh, which I mean, not going to lie, I didn't even know what this was until I listened to the Blast Points episode Blast about points, the super yep. live. <laughs> Um, but had I been paying closer attention in the 90s, I should have known about it. Um, Ryan, you can only buy, you're only able to go back and buy one piece of Super Live Adventure merchandise. What are you going to grab? Man, um, probably, you know, I, I wish the, Super Live Adventure button was a plate <laughs> from the Hamilton collection. Yeah, yeah, if that if that was a plate, that would be my choice. What about you? Well, it's a, it's a it's a it's a toss up for me between the um, the poster twenty five by thirty six with a sweet image of George Lucas and his printed signature. Um, mm-hmm. That was only a dollar fifty. So the thrifty side of me is like let's go for that um but then for only double that price only three dollars i could get the george lucas super live adventure cutout which is a cutout collage that uh features artwork from indiana jones star wars tucker willow and american graffiti um and that's pretty cool but i might have to go with the poster because the cutout does not actually feature george's face it just features Mm -hmm. you know characters from his his movies so i think i might go with the poster there yeah so cool um all right well uh the rest of the magazine now that's the end of the jawa trader uh unfortunately yeah which was about half the magazine yeah totally totally (laughs) right which i mean is one of my favorite things about it but um then it gets into like the actual sort of like more the articles the the meteor content of the magazine um the very first thing in here is a great um kind of piece on carrie fisher uh, interview with her and an article by uh, about her by Pamela Roller, and uh, it's called it's titled Life After Leia, and uh, it, it's kind of like focused mainly on her writing career and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really good. And and my favorite quote from here is from Carrie um, when she was asked about if she would work on the prequels, writing the prequels, if she would help write the prequels or not. Um, she said he had me. This is George. She's talking about, of course. He had me sign a napkin saying I would help punch it up. Or maybe it was to do the script. I can't remember. But I want to. George, I want to. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess there were there were conversations. And, and we know that she did come in and, and um, do a pass on at least one of the prequel scripts, if not all of them. I don't remember for sure. Mm-hmm. But she did work on them a little bit. Um, I can't imagine Carrie Fisher just straight up writing the prequel movies. <laughs> like, uh, George, I'll write them. <laughs> I want to see that uh, <laughs> that alternate reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, she did work on him a little bit, and um, that uh, I I love that because I think it kind of shows like you know George's um, appreciation of her as a writer. Uh, and mm-hmm. this is at the time that she's had a couple books come out and and uh, a couple of scripts and stuff too. And so people were um, definitely realizing like what a talented writer she was. But for George to be like okay, Carrie, I'm going to make you sign this napkin so I can hold you to it that you're going to help me with these prequel scripts. Like, I love that idea. Like, what a great image Mm -hmm. and and, uh, concept there. So, Yeah, um, something that's like, 
kind of interesting about this uh, particular article and interview um, is it spends a few uh, paragraphs talking about her drug use, Mm -hmm. which um, I don't feel really comes up in conversation like Star Wars related conversations like after this point basically (laughs) like even through um you know like i don't know but like i guess she wasn't really covered relating to star wars like that much after this point and i i don't know well i think that's just i think it's what's kind of cool about this article though is that it's not really about it's not so much about carrie fisher in star wars and i feel like as insider went on it would be more like like whenever usually when they would interview people or do an article on someone or whatever, it would be very like Star Wars centric, which, you know, that's what mm-hmm. people are looking for. It's fine. It's not a problem. But this one is like, hey, Carrie Fisher is a person who has a life outside of Star Wars. Yeah. And yeah. We're gonna just write about like her writing career and, you know, who she is and that sort of thing. And then we'll tie it back to Star Wars, you know, periodically. But it's not just like, you know, I feel like sometimes you read stuff like this and it's like, um, okay, so we're going to do the piece on Carrie Fisher, but like we only care about her life as it relates to Star Wars, and that is all. So um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, th- I thought this was, was more, um, it, it was more uh, kind of like appreciating her, you know, as a human being, <laughs> not just somebody who is, uh, is, is someone that contributed to Star Wars. So um, Yeah, I agree. Um, but I also think like the, like the talk about drugs and stuff just doesn't come up in, um, you know, like later Star Wars adjacent coverage of her. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, yeah. And I think maybe the two reasons for that would be A, that this is um, from, you know, a time when she had. It was closer to when she was publishing books that were very personal and about her, mm-hmm. you know, life and experience and that sort of thing. Um, so she was probably just talking about this stuff more. Um, and then I think, too, you know, they probably would try to sanitize or, you know, kind of like, yeah, not <laughs> not address that stuff. Star Wars, Lucasfilm in general, like as time went on, I feel like they probably were mm-hmm. avoiding that stuff, too. So, yeah. A yeah. little bit from both columns there, but I, I think it was a pretty, uh, definitely a pretty informative, interesting article for sure. Um, the next one, more of a curio <laughs> or a like, hey, this is what people were saying about the holiday special at the time, but there's an article about the, the Star Wars holiday special. And uh, my only note I put in the notes is that they roast it. Um, <laughs> they, they write about the Star Wars holiday special, but uh, really kind of like it's, it's just burying it for being bad, which of course it is, but uh yeah. Um, for instance, there is a caption uh, uh, underneath the photo of uh, Carrie Fisher and uh, C-3PO singing, and the text reads, a highlight or a low point. <laughs> Carrie Fisher <laughs> sings the Life Day song set to the tune of the Star Wars theme. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, like, <laughs> uh I don't know. Like it kind of it kind of ends with um like yeah, this is bad, but it's also fun. Um which I think is like the only opinion to have on the Star Wars holiday special. Um and so I don't know. I think it's it's pretty right on. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I'm not look, I'm not I'm not over here arguing Actually, if you take another look at the holiday special, it's super good, and they should not be disrespecting it. Like, no, it's fine that they're making fun of this holiday special. It sucks. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it is funny, though, because I do feel like, again, like, as Insider and just, like, Star Wars coverage and stuff would, would change or, or evolve going forward, I think they would either, A, never acknowledge its existence or only in passing commentary acknowledge its existence, or if they were going to do a feature on it, they would probably... I don't know. It would be more objective and, you know, kind of like they wouldn't just make fun of it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So uh, it would be more promotional, I guess. I feel like Insider, I mean, it's promotional here. It's half of it is the Jawa Trader. So <laughs> there's no question about that. But 
uh, that definitely as time goes on, I don't think I see official Lucasfilm um, commentary sort of making fun of stuff. Although I say that, and I just watched the Star Wars show uh, from last week, which they <laughs> they went to um, San Diego Comic Con. And uh, Anthony Carboni was cracking me up because he was talking about the Sith Trooper. And like <laughs> every time he would just kept talking about how it's red, you know, and it, I feel like it was like almost, you know, sort of gently making fun of the fact that it's like, hey, it's a stormtrooper, but it's red. And yeah. <laughs> we're selling all this merchandise because it's a red stormtrooper. <laughs> Did you watch yep. it? I haven't watched it yet. Oh, man, it's really funny. That sounds great. There's one point when he, like, walks up to some Stormtrooper cosplayers or 501st members or whatever, and they're just, like, standard Stormtroopers, and he's like, uh, you guys haven't heard. We're red now. It's it's red, <laughs> you know? And he's just, like, tons of little <laughs> comments like that, and it's like, okay, well, maybe, maybe uh, you know, as I said, that, that previous thing, it's like, I guess Lucasfilm can still have fun, sort of, you know, very gently, very, very... Um, I don't know. Yeah. Very gently kind of making fun of certain things from, you know, from the company. So, yeah, yeah. I think star Wars show is like the front line on that, on the, on that sort of thing. As far as like official takes go. He, he um, also, he also makes a, a representative and I appreciate him for doing this, but he makes a representative from Funko very uncomfortable on camera. Cause he's like, ah, and there's a Kitzer Funko and the guy's like, no, no, there's not like, don't, I can't, <laughs> I can't be on camera <laughs> while you say that this product exists that doesn't. It's pretty fun. So <laughs> love yeah. it. Um, I do want to say again, like just going back to uh, this being kind of the the wild west of Star Wars official <laughs> writing. Uh, there is a line on page forty four. There is the sentence, "Whoa, kinky space love." <laughs> Uh, I don't see it. I'm looking for it. I don't see it's it. It's in but... the middle. It's in regards to the VR helmet oh, that, yeah. uh, that Grandpa Wook puts on. Which is so weird. It's so it's weird. So, weird. Yeah. It's, it's so we- uncomfortable. I see it there. Whoa. Kinky space love. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, okay. Maybe I think the best feature, um, or at least uh, up there with the Carrie Fisher one, is this interview with Kenny Baker. And mm-hmm. there's some great stuff in here. Um, he tells a story about um, uh, being on set with his kids in Harrison Ford, in which um, his kids, I don't know, couldn't say Harrison or didn't want to say Harrison or something. And uh, Harrison told them to just call him Peaches. Um, and that he says at the time, and to this day, my boys uh, call Harrison Peaches. So I love that. Like, you know, grumpy Harrison Ford is the one we always hear about. But then, you know, on the set of... Uh, uh, of star wars you know um he offered harrison ford offered to like take the kids around and show them around the set and uh yeah they couldn't say harrison ford so he said oh just call me peaches um i've never heard that before and i thought it was pretty funny uh and cute um mm-hmm. another thing here is kenny baker says uh that he didn't get on didn't get along with richard marquand as well uh, i didn't know why he didn't seem to use me very much um but uh, yeah, so a little bit of a, a, a negative commentary on, on Richard Marquand because he's like, oh, George is great. Irvin Kirshner is very funny. Uh, I didn't get along with Richard Marquand. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other thing too, uh, which is, you know, pretty, I guess this is well-tread ground at this point, but um, they ask him about his relationship with Anthony Daniels and he says, we are not exactly close. I found him to not be an easy guy to get close to. So, um, but he does say we didn't argue or anything, just that they weren't close. So I don't know. Cause I've heard what? that they kind of hated each other, but. Oh. Hmm. You, I, you didn't know that? No. Yeah. yeah. Kenny Baker and Anthony that. Daniels, like apparently, um, didn't get along too well at all. So, uh, the way Kenny Baker describes it here is, um, you know, that they weren't too close, but they didn't argue or anything. I've heard, uh, stories that suggest otherwise that they just really didn't like each other, but, um. I don't know. Mm, anyway, uh, also an interview with uh, Dennis Lawson here. We're, we're almost done uh, with the magazine, but uh, interview with, um, with Dennis Lawson. I thought this was interesting. At one point, he says that George talked about three trilogies when they were working on the original trilogy. So I don't know why I'm so fascinated with like how many trilogies there would be or what George's plan mm-hmm. was, because I think the obvious truth is that 
it just changed all the time. And that depending yeah. on when you talk to him, he had one, two, three, or four trilogies <laughs> that he was going to do. Um, so, but whenever I see something from like, oh, in 1976, George was saying this about how many trilogies there would be. I just always find that like pretty compelling. Um, mm-hmm. But there, I don't think there's any answer like, you know, he always thought it would be 12. He always thought it would be nine. He always thought it'd be six. Like he had no idea or, or his idea changed depending on what kind of mood he was in, I think. So, um, yeah, but yeah, he's, uh, Dennis Lawson comes across as uh, pretty positive about star Wars here and, uh, and, and pretty thankful for the opportunity. Um, and so as I was reading this article or interview, I was kind of wondering, I wonder if he'll pop up in, in the rise of Skywalker, if there's a possibility of that. Uh, what do you think? Ooh. Because they asked him to come back for Force Awakens and he didn't want to do it. Then probably not. Yeah. Um, I kind of felt like maybe, uh, yeah, I guess probably not. I don't need him in there. I definitely don't. And I'm sure it would just be a cameo anyway. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's fine. <laughs> but like i'm also like we we know where we stand on this the new trilogy is about the new characters yeah like it's cool to have like lando show up for like a cameo or something but it's about the new characters and it needs to be that so well La- lando i i feel like is um definitely you know um there's a there's a more justification like it's more necessary for lando to show up again because he's like a primary character i feel like um not that he has to show up but like yeah there's multiple reasons where i feel like lando is a is a better fit to bring back um for at least one of these movies so um yeah yeah Uh, that's fair but 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 wedge i think we can we'd be okay without wedge coming back so uh, okay, um, almost done. Scouting the Galaxy, Stephen J. Sansweet. This is the um, the uh, column that he would do in each um, magazine about Star Wars products, as he is uh, obviously the Star Wars product guy and was an employee of Lucasfilm at the time. Um, and in this one, he talks or he writes all about um, his Tomart's price guide to worldwide Star Wars collectibles. And um, as I said before, I need to track this down. But um, mm-hmm. it's really interesting to read about his process of putting together um, this price guide or this this um, book. And, um, of course, there's some images of some really cool Star Wars product uh, in the article. And, of course, um, there would be more in, in, the, in the book itself. So um, definitely need to track that down. But um, to, to read about collectibles and collecting from Stephen Sansweet, Steve Sansweet at any time is, uh, is always interesting, but especially, you know, at this point too, when, um, we were kind of in between eras of, of Star Wars products, you know, um, or just at the very beginning of ramping up the, the Star Wars product thing again, um, this would be of course very much about like vintage products and, and the products from the seventies and eighties. So, um, mm-hmm. pretty cool. It's got a great uh, subhead as well. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want? Do you want to share that? From Vader Mellows to Leia panties. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. I feel like if this article was an insider today, it, that subhead would probably be a little different. I think so. I do think so. Yeah, and I, I don't think they would say Leia panties. Vader Vader Mellows. <laughs> That's where they would draw the line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, vulgar. Also cool is, is the fact that you there are insider classifieds here. So at the time in 94, <laughs> um, if you wanted to buy something or if you wanted to sell something, you could purchase a, a little classified ad in the back of Star Wars Insider. So, um, yeah. Somebody, uh, Eric, Sh- Eric Schwendke in uh, Everett, Washington, is looking for one new condition copy of the Star Wars Galaxy Guide number six, Tramp Freighters. Came out from West End Games in 1990. He wants that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope someone uh, I hope someone hooked him up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Um, so that is a wrap on Star Wars Insider Magazine, except for um, there are some advertisements for Ken Stacy's Star Wars Fine Art, which, speaking of aesthetics, it has a look. Um, it's pretty mm-hmm. interesting. 
Um, and then my fave, the metal collector's cards, the Star Wars A New Hope metal collector's cards. Um, and these come from, what's the name of this company again? Metallic Impressions Incorporated. Yeah. Um, I couldn't figure out how many cards are in this set, but they are made out of metal. So that's pretty sweet. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, that's a look back at the the first issue of Star Wars Insider, uh, issue number twenty three, and um, man, it's uh, it's definitely kind of fun to go back and 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 look at um, at uh, the state of Star Wars fandom and stuff at that time. And I just love Star Wars Insider um, and uh, love what it represented to me as a fan at that time. So um, definitely cool to be able to go back and and look at those uh, or look at that early issue. And, and the old products and all that kind of stuff, so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is a whole nother rabbit hole. Sorry. Um, M- Star Wars metal collector's cards <laughs> is a thing. Okay. It's not just these. Right. Um, there are a lot of metal Star Wars collector's cards. Um, there's a Shadows of the Empire series. Okay. All right. Um, imagine like a metal Shizor. Shizor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Beat you to yeah. it. Already was. Um, what do those go for? <laughs> uh, practically nothing. <laughs> Everything's like under twenty dollars for like sealed sets. Um, there's like Dark Empire two metal collectors cards. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot. Three hundred and seventy eight results. Nice. Well, you know, I, so, I do have a, a tin back there. Uh, remember I showed you mm. that a couple episodes back, my round tin with like six metal trading cards in them um, or whatever they are. I think they're metal, but yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's like one of those things where it, it's supposed to like probably add value or whatever, but now me looking at it, I'm like, do I want some like heavy metal card or do I want like a cardboard card or a card stock card I could just put into a binder, you know what I mean? With, Mm -hmm. in a sheet. Um, I feel like it's almost like less, less desirable to have, uh, to have that kind of thing, but. Yeah. I mean, at least have a lot. I, I, I want to know more about the breakdown of the metal. Like if, (laughs) if these were pewter (laughs) cards with maybe like, if, if, if I'd have some gold freight, if I'd have like, like residue on my hands when I was border. done like handling the cards, then okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something that kind of combined the best of like the plates and the pewters. Yeah. Together. Is is it possible to melt these cards down and make candles out of them? Because if that's the case, then, uh, yeah, God. you can do that with what pewter, do right? Are there pewter candles? These... Like like what, the can like these... the candle holder I guess right the candle itself couldn't be pewter could it? Do they still make pewter? Where does <laughs> pewter come from? Like is it is this conflict pewter? Because I'm not supporting that. Right, let me ask you a question, Ryan. Um, yeah. It's fall of 2019. Um, you get a new issue of Star Wars Insider, and there is an advertisement in that issue for. Um, three inch pewter figures of the rise of Skywalker principal cast of characters. Like, are you spending? My wallet is out. (laughs) Are you buying, are you buying $20 pewter rise of Skywalker? I think we'd have to, wouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what if it's like 50 bucks for a set of like six pewter figures? Then I think I would go for it. $20 $20 a piece, three inches, like tiny little, I think I would need, yeah, too much. I, I will tell you this, I don't though. Know. If, if I don't know. 2019, they put the Hamilton collection, puts out a Rise of Skywalker collectible plate, I'm on it. Definitely. Done. That Done. I would go for. Yeah. That, uh, that, that would start the collection, the, the addiction. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, um, as I said, uh, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, listening to us reminisce about Star Wars Insider 23. Uh, it was certainly fun for me to go back and look at the the issue, if nothing else. So, 
um, yeah, long live Star Wars Insider. Um, as far as the podcast goes, you can check out everything we do at blockaderunnerpodcast.com and uh, email us and let us know uh, what you think about the show or, um, you know, if you want to tell us uh, what you'd like to see as far as pewter collectibles go, um, you can do that at uh, blockaderunnerpodcast at gmail.com. What, what would be on that Rise of Skywalker collectible plate? Claude? Sound off in the comments. <laughs> Oh, I see. You were asking our listeners. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, should they like exist? Button. Yeah. Oh. Um, yep. Yeah. Follow, well. follow the show on Twitter uh, at Blockade Run. Follow Ryan on Twitter at Braun Dwarf. B R A W N D W A R F. If you do collect uh, Star Wars pewter or uh, plates, uh, please uh, tweet them at me. I I want to see I want to see your collections. I want to I want to get inspired for my own. Is there a Facebook? How do you display them? How do you display the the plates? Like, what do you do with them? There you like, go. You, maybe we, like, maybe next episode can be all listener feedback, um, and it'll just be sort of a uh, a forum, a roundtable on how to care for collectible plates, how to display collectible plates, mm-hmm. um, maybe ranking the best collectible Star Wars collectible plates. So we'd stick just to Star Wars, obviously, but yeah, yeah. I, l- I like your use of round table thing as well. <laughs> I'm talking about plates. Okay, got to go. Time to end this show. Thank you very much for watching and or listening. We'll be back soon with more Blockade Runner Podcast. Do people like eat off the plates? Like, or are they just for display? 